I'm here with my Polaroid 110A conversion to the Lomo GraphLock back. We're going to check out some shots with Ashley. Stick around for a quick message at the end. In the beginning of Polaroid's consumer camera business was roll film and the professional grade Pathfinder cameras built in conjunction with Yashica. And there's a lot more about this format of Polaroid film on channels like Analog Resurgence and a recent video by In An Instant. Super recommend those videos and channels. But today we're talking about the 110A and 110B Pathfinder cameras in specific. They were folding cameras with 4x5 quality lenses that people have been modifying for years. I first saw this specific modification for the Lomography Lomograph back on Ripsy's channel and then found the source of his conversion. Albert Cornelison, I think. I, I probably screwed that up. He made this awesome guide on how he converted his 110B and then put his 3D printer files on Thingiverse where you can download them and use them yourself which is what I did. He has parts specifically marked for the 110A and 110B and they're good and really well designed. And I went to the site Exometry. I guess that's how you say that. Exometry is a 3D printing service for those without 3D printers. But I also got one of the grips printed at a local library for much cheaper. So there are multiple options. So you don't have to own a lot of stuff to do this. For the tripod screws, I found these on Amazon, but I don't know how happy I am with them. Also, I enjoy that this little built-in flash cable on the Polaroid can be pulled out and you can sub it in for your own PC cable. The hardest thing is to adjust the rangefinder, which is actually not that difficult. It just took me a couple of tries. Also, this is the 110A rangefinder that I have and that little arrow points out the vertical adjustment. Super handy to know. And yes, you should not do this destructive conversion because he's going to launch a non-destructive one soon, but keep an eye out. That is my library printed right grip. This is the top with the little tripod screw you can see. I hacksawed the door off in lieu of a left grip and stuffed the empty area with foam. I also drilled out the bottom hole and added a little bit of epoxy on the outside of a tripod adapter to create a new tripod socket. <laughs> So of course the next step is to go out and shoot it. And mind you, this is after a couple of test runs to make sure I had the focus dialed in. One of the things I love about this setup is that it has that little PC socket from the now vestigial flash cable that was built into it that I just cut off of the hot shoot. It makes it easier to work on the rangefinder and the hot shoe doesn't even work with modern flashes anyway. You'll notice that since I retain the left hand grip and the strap, I actually hold it upside down, which I find kind of preferable since the right grip also has a place for the release cable to act as a shutter button. It was a little harder to find my flash settings this day because I inadvertently forgot my flash meter and a digital camera, so I had to use the Instax wide film as one would use Polaroid film back in the day and I made test shots with it. I wouldn't really recommend it for this purpose because Instax wide and Instax film in general shoots around 800 ISO so you have to do a little math to make it work for other things. It also has a very weird and narrow dynamic range. I discovered again as I do often why Fujifilm seems to prefer that Instax be shot with a flash all the time. You can watch my Instax and Polaroid kind of history video linked in the description below if you want to catch up on some of those details. But overall, aside from a problem we'll discuss in a second, these shots turned out fine once I kind of settled on an exposure. So being basically a 4x5 lens, the lens on this 110A and the B have to be cocked before they're fired. So there's a little lever like you saw earlier where you kind of pull it and you prime everything so you can shoot the photo. Well, the thing is, I kind of slip occasionally when I try to do that. So this happens and it opens the shutter just slightly before I take the photo and here it is right here where I kind of lose it and it doesn't fully engage. So you have to watch out for that so you don't partially expose a photo. So you'll see as I go, I start flipping the lens cap that's built in up while I cock the shutter so that I can avoid this issue. That said, it's not really that difficult to deal with. And 
once I get used to holding the camera upside down, shooting this as a main camera will be pretty intuitive and easy, I believe. And as much as I love Polaroid's current offerings, Instax still definitely develops a lot faster, so you're able to see what you're doing within a couple of minutes, at least enough to know that you probably did or didn't blow out the shot. So that's pretty cool. If we could have like Instax 400 or Instax 160 or something like that, that might be nice, but otherwise you can, you can kind of math your way through it. My one complaint though is that Instax is kind of dull especially in comparison to Polaroid's stuff, but that's more stuff I talked about in my comparison video. As usual, especially with a flash, Instax Wide is vibrant and extra sharp and it makes a great companion to this wonderful 4x5 style large format lens. Still, this wasn't really a shoot I only wanted to do Instax with and I honestly rarely do one camera per shoot. So I wanted to see how it could do, especially in light of forgetting my light meter or a digital camera, I wanted to see how it would do as a test camera so I could get my exposure on the Instax. And then when I was shooting Lomo 800 actually, it was a pretty good one-to-one -one comparison. And speaking of film that looks good with a flash, Lomo 800 is great with a flash. I don't think the Lomo 100 or 400 is the Kodak Gold that just got announced like today. So yeah, future videos about that for sure. But I think it is like in the Kodak disposable line, but look how great this Lomo 800 looks with a flash. I'm so excited by this. And the thought of going out with like proper Kodak Gold and Lomo 800 and Cinestill 400D has me super excited, but uh, back on track because I've got some more film to show you. And I like a lot of it. So the next part of this would be where I compare the light meter type reading I get from using the Instax wide camera as a sort of meter versus a meter that's built into a camera. So first is the Instax wide and though I like some of them or basically these four these shots reveal some of the limitations of Instax wide as a film. Although it's sharp, you can see that it doesn't really hold much when it blows out and it doesn't have as much vibrance when it's underexposed. The good thing is, as I mentioned, that these are nice and sharp, the colors are accurate, and they're not bad. And it does hold the sky pretty well despite the difference there. And in keeping with the Fuji theme outside of the Lomo 800, I got my Nikon F3 and loaded it with Fuji Superior 400, just the typical consumer stuff. And I decided to shoot a roll with the in-camera light meter, which, you know, ideally gives me a comparison of metering techniques. And of course, it, you know, uh, I could have had my Sekonic or a digital layer, but I, I like how these turned out. Uh, I think outdoors, especially, Superior really sings because you don't have to push the shadows that much. Uh, it has, much like Instax, a very muted color representation, but beautiful nonetheless. Although it, it is a little bit more vibrant than Instax. So one last one. As we conclude, for some strange reason, I thought, let's shoot Velvia 50. Slide film is super unforgiving and this is expensive and 50 ISO and the last thing I measured was 800 ISO. How hard could it be without a flash meter in a different location and different lighting? I decided to find out. I definitely should have used some Instax wide shots here to measure this, but gotta see how it is with and without it, right? Overall, I say the modification is totally worth it. And also worth it, I hope, is supporting me on Patreon. For as little as a dollar a month, you can join the awesome people here on screen. There are behind the scenes looks polls, feedback, and communication, and I super appreciate it. It's really awesome, kind of like this Polaroid 110A slash B conversion. I definitely think you should wait for the non-destructive version that will be posted, I'm sure, soon. But if you have a broken Pathfinder or just want to do it now, I think it's totally worth it. It wasn't super difficult. Just follow the directions on Albert's website, and uh, yeah. I, I say go for it and I am fairly pleased with these Velvia 50 pictures thankfully because that would have kind of sucked to waste that but check back in just a week for the return of women with film with the very amazing Michelle Singletary 
I'm excited about this. It's almost finished. Uh, and here's the thumbnail. So if you want to see that and other things like you see on screen here, subscribe, turn on notifications, leave a comment, like the video, and uh, I'll see you around. Thanks.